High blocking or blocking to the head is the shortest rule in the 2015 rules, measuring in at just 103 words. And although the 2017 rules don't really take to word counting as much, it's still pretty small when compared to other penalties. So as you might expect, this is a pretty simple rule. But if you ask skaters after a game, there's a pretty good chance that they'll tell you what was missed was a lot of this very simple rule. Coming right behind that is blocking with the head. Technically, there are two different families now. High blocking is impact to an illegal target zone, and blocking with the head is impact with an illegal blocking zone. But there's still two sides of the same coin. And since both rules are pretty short, it seemed like a good time to go over both of these rules. Before we begin, however, I'd like to give you some fair warning. This presentation is not the official word from the WFTDA or MRDA. I am a level 4 referee with the WFTDA, but I am not working for them, and this has no official approval from them. I'm just a guy who wants to help out. And like anything that doesn't come with a WFTDA or MRDA seal of approval, take with an appropriate level of salt. In an effort to keep this presentation as correct as possible, I'm including the date that this presentation was recorded. In the event that I need to update the presentation due to something that was clarified or just out and out wrong, this date will change and there will be an update in the change log that's listed with the presentation on refed.com. This presentation was originally recorded on September 6, 2015. Updates were made on February 22, 2017 for the 2017 update to the rules of Flat Track Roller Derby. Let's start with the more common high block call. If there's ever a rule where the new philosophy of impact assessment makes sense, it's with high blocks. Impact above the collarbone, meaning neck and head, is illegal and extraordinarily dangerous. It's not something we want to leave to the traditional impact spectrum of down, out of bounds, or loss of position. In fact, it can take very little physical pressure to be a high impact and high pain action. I'd like you to take a moment and perform a little exercise. Take one of your fingers, brace it against your thumb, and then flick the tip of your nose. It hurt, didn't it? The thing with high blocks, and probably why it gets missed so often, is that it doesn't take much force to hurt like hell. I did some looking and found that a typical finger flick generates about eight newtons of force. To break someone's nose, it takes 40 to 58 newtons of force, not a whole lot more to start causing more serious damage. So if you closed your eyes and flinched before flicking your own nose, think about how much more it would hurt to have someone's arm, shoulder, or helmet connect with the face. And think about how little contact actually has to be made for it to hurt. And that's why it can be very difficult to catch high blocks. Sure, we can catch the big ones, but could we really see the equivalent of a finger flick from our positions? In most of these presentations I have, I try to share what I've learned to help call these penalties better. And I'll be honest, I don't have a great one. I have a ton of sympathy for skaters who tell me that either I, or if I'm the head ref, my crew are missing high blocks because they're probably right. The best I can hope for is that we're catching some of them, catching the really blatant ones, because if all it takes is that little flick to hurt like hell, well, you know why there's a rise in the number of face shields in the game. My best suggestion is to be cognizant of when faces come in close proximity to other opponents' body parts. Sometimes with size differences, that's any time a skater is in the pack. If you're a head referee and you've been told there are high blocks being missed, See if the skaters can tell you if there's anything systemic happening. Is it always happening in one part of the pack or always to a jammer? Like any other information we get from captains, we don't want to focus only on one team or one player or even assume they're right, but conversely, we don't want to assume that they're wrong. So let's shift to the other side of the coin, blocking with the head. Although the 2015 rules are no longer in effect, I love the old rule. Quote, the head may not be used to block an opponent, unquote. 
The rule goes on to say that incidental contact that doesn't cost laws of relative position is a no impact penalty. But incidental contact that does cause a loss of relative position or just initiating a block with the head with contact regardless of impact or advantage is a penalty. Honestly, not much has changed with the 2017 rules. Blocking with the head is still illegal because it's not listed as a legal blocking zone in Rule 2.4.2. And because of the terrible risk that comes with that, we can judge the impact of it and penalize it accordingly. There are two areas that muddy the waters a bit. The first is an area that's been plaguing me and other referees for a while, which is skaters who lead with their head. There's a dual argument that comes into play when this happens, and I can tell you what normally happens, but first let me tell you of the arguments. The first argument is that leading with the head is dangerous, but doesn't impact the rest of the game. If someone leads with the head and gets an elbow in the face, the call should still be a high block. The second argument is that leading with the head is analogous to blocking with the head, and that a high block shouldn't be called, and if there's a call at all, it could be on the skater who led with her head. Frequently, we get a no call. When the incident happens, we as referees can't see the difference in that split second between someone initiating their position with their head forward and the honest-to-goodness high block, and so no call is made at all. This is an initiation call, plain and simple. If the person leading with the head moved into an established position of an opponent and gets hit, then it's a penalty to the skater leading with the head. If she has established position, or the opponent moves an arm into that skater's established face, then the opposite is true. Can it be really difficult to tell who initiated? Absolutely. Most of the time when we think of initiation, we think of a full body initiating into another body. But when blocks to and from the head come into play, it's often not a body that's initiating, but a part of the body, such as an arm, or as you might imagine, the head itself. I've ref people who lead with their heads, and yes, it does increase the number of blocks to their face and calls in their favor, if you think getting a bop in the kisser is something in their favor. But I think I've done just as many or more no calls where I can't tell who initiated or couldn't see the contact. My suggestion is to be ready to explain that call or no call when it comes up. Have sympathy. Understand why they want that call and why they may not understand your no call should it happen. Nobody ever said our job was going to be an easy one. The second item that muddies the waters, and even potentially muddies our last scenario, has to do with positionally blocking with the head. There is a casebook entry about using the head to positionally block someone. In it, it says that unintentionally positionally blocking with the head is not a penalty, but deliberately doing so is. So when we talk about people leading with the head, like from the last slide, this is specifically excluded. If a player is natural gameplay position is leading with the head and it isn't deliberately using it as a get out of my way card, then it's not a penalty. What is a penalty is deliberately using the head to either draw a penalty or to force opposing skaters out of their way. And if the action is so bad that it risks injury to both skaters, as if risking your own neck wasn't bad enough, you would need to recommend or call an expulsion. No contact is needed. So, let me summarize. Positional blocking with the head is not penalizable unless it's being deliberate. And if it is deliberate and dangerous enough, an expulsion could be in order. I try to never complain when people say we're missing blocks to the head or blocks with the head. Our number one job is safety. And all they can be very difficult to spot, that doesn't relieve us of trying to find them. 
Head injuries are common enough through normal gameplay. The better we can do to catch them and to have them minimized, the happier everyone will be. I'd like to thank the following photographers who graciously allowed me to use their photographs in this presentation. Doff Lensgren, Preflash Gordon, and Quick and Derby. I'd also like to thank Wolfbiked, Dr. Sorters, and Miss Behaven for volunteering to help me with my stage photos in this presentation, as well as the Minnesota Roller Girls for allowing me to use their practice space for these photos. If you found this presentation helpful, or think it or other presentations at refed.com might be helpful to others, please share this site. But please do not modify it or send it out without appropriate credit for its production. This presentation is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License.